Good morning. Good morning. Well, please turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 87. Let me read the seven verses in Psalm 87. Then we read the Psalm of the Sons of Korah, a song. His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. Selah. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me. Behold, O Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia. This one was born there. And of Zion it will be said, this one and that one were born in her. And the Most High himself shall establish her. The Lord will record when he registers the peoples. This one was born here. Selah. Both the singers and the players on instruments say, all my springs are in you. Let's pray. Our God and Father, as we come to your word, we come recognizing that we need your spirit to open up our eyes and to unclog our ears. And Lord, we need your spirit to grant us understanding and wisdom. And Lord, even pay attention. And Lord, we can't know anything, spiritually speaking, Lord, unless you grant it to us. And so we pray now. Please help me to preach, or even through my frailties and weaknesses and inabilities, Lord, please use me as a tool, as a vehicle, Lord, to bless your people, to encourage your people, Lord, to challenge your people, and Lord, to wake up the dead. And so, Father, please make much of Christ as we now look into your word, and we ask in his name. Amen. Well, it's been said that America is a great melting pot, a mix of many peoples uh, and many cultures. And no place really displays this better than, I think, our own city, New York City. I mean, you can go around the world if you just go around the five boroughs. And there, I'm told, 36% of the population in the five boroughs is foreign born. And there are over 200 different languages spoken in the five boroughs. I read an article about five years ago uh, that said that that there were 70 nations of people along the number seven train, along the seven line. So from Flushing to Long Island City, that they said there were 70 different people groups along that train route. And we have parades for most of these groups of peoples. Uh, and not to mention a smorgasbord of some of the finest foods in the world we'll find in these five boroughs. So New York City is an excellent example of a melting pot. Well, in Psalm 87, we have an even greater example of a melting pot, and that is Zion, or the city of God, which is a picture of the church or represents the church. Uh, and the melting pot that Psalm 87 is speaking of is that of Jews and Gentiles, or Jews and non-Jews, uh, becoming God's people and worshiping Him as His universal church, where people from all nations and all cultures become the people of God through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Well, Psalm 87 is a psalm of the sons of Korah, we're told in verse 1, and Korah, or Kohath, was one of the three sons of Levi. Uh, and the Kohathites became the doorkeepers and the custodians of the tabernacle. And then eventually, of course, the temple. And under David, they also became the leaders of music, if you will, or of choral and orchestral music uh, in the tabernacle. Which is why verse 1 says, this psalm is a song. What I'd like to do uh, with this short setup is consider this psalm, which talks about the glory of of, uh, of Zion, the beauty of Zion, and the city of God by using a, a really simple three-point outline. And that is the Lord loves, the Lord's love for the city of God, the people of the city of God, and the joy in the city of God. And so let's look at verses 1 to 3 again. The Lord's love for the city of God. His foundation is in His holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God, Selah. 
Before we dig into these verses, we need to define some terms to give some definitions. The holy mountains, he says your foundation is in the holy mountains. Well, those are the mountains which Jerusalem is built on uh, and which surround it. The word Zion refers to Jerusalem. This word is used 150 times in the Old Testament and it is almost always speaking of the city of Jerusalem. So, for example, we see in Psalm 147, verse 13, it says, Praise the Lord of Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. So Zion is a figurative and a poetic way of saying Jerusalem. Now the gates of Zion uh, were the gates which allowed people in and out of Jerusalem. And the city of God is just another reference, again, to Jerusalem. As Psalm 46 4 will show us. There we read, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place, of the tabernacle of the Most High. And of course, the, the tabernacle was in Jerusalem. So the mountains are holy because Jerusalem is holy. And Zion and the city of God are just figurative, figurative ways of speaking about Jerusalem. Now Zion in the New Testament is not speaking of a literal place. It is not speaking of a physical city, but rather it is speaking of a spiritual place, a place comprised of the people of God, and it signifies the church. We see in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 23, we read, But you, you, the people of God, have, become, have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. So we're not part of a physical Zion or a physical city of God or the literal Jerusalem, but a heavenly one a spiritual one, which is the invisible church, or the universal church, which has, has in it all of those who are born again, all of those who are born from above. And they are from all over the world. Peter said, speaking of, of believers, he said in 1 Peter verses two, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, he said, coming to him, Christ, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 6, he actually quotes Isaiah 28 there, and he says, Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. And of course, Christ is the chief cornerstone. And the church is built on him. He is the head of the church. It is his body made up of his purchased people. So Zion and the city of God represents the church. Now, going back to verse 1, the psalmist says his foundation is in the holy mountains. And I believe the foundation which he is speaking about here is the temple which stood on the holy mountains. And this too is a, a type of the church. And what makes the foundation holy, and what makes uh, the temple holy, is that that is where God chose to dwell on earth. He chose to dwell in the temple. This is where his presence was uh, among the people of Israel. Uh, and, and that is where he chose to meet with them. It was in the holy of holies uh, that the Shekinah glory uh, was, where it filled the temple. It was in the temple that the sacrifices were offered up to him for sins through his mediators or the priest. And Jerusalem and the temple was where all of Israel went to worship God during the feast. So Zion and the city of God was where men met with God and where they found forgiveness and where they would find salvation. Verse 2 then says, The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. And this doesn't mean that he literally loves the physical gates, or the iron, I'm assuming that it was made from iron pieces, but rather what they do, rather what they do, and what they do is they let people come in. They let people come into Zion, into Jerusalem, to worship him. Now we have to ask the question, why does God love Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob? And notice uh, that he loves the dwellings of Jacob also, uh, but he says he loves Zion more. And I believe it is because of what Zion displays. And in order to understand that, we need to go back to the very first time we see the word Zion used in the Bible. Uh, and that would go all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 5. 
And in 2 Samuel chapter 5, King Saul has died. Uh, and some of the tribes of Israel, they come to David, and they ask David to be their king. Uh, and we, we see that, indeed, for seven years David reigns as king in Hebron. Uh, and while there, we read this in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 5 of 2 Samuel. We read, And the king and his men, that would be David and his men, went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. All right, so what do you have? You have the Jebusites, who were from Jerusalem, uh, said there was no way that David and his men were going to come in there and take their stronghold from them. This wasn't going to do it. They said, listen, even the blind among us and the lame among us, they can beat you down, David, and they can beat your men down, and we're not going to let you take our land. You're not going to take our stronghold. So they bragged that even the weakest of the Jebusites could defend Jerusalem or defend Zion, and they could defeat David. It would be like this. When you know when you were a kid, some kid picking on another kid said, I can beat you with one hand tied behind my back with my pinky finger. In other words, there's no way you can beat me. There's no way you can beat me. <laughs> but we read that David took the stronghold of Zion. Therefore, Zion is the place Zion is the place where the stronghold of God's enemies were defeated and conquered and ousted. And God gave it to his people through David. And then God made that the city where he would dwell, Jerusalem. And spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, God loves Zion or the church because in it he has conquered the strongholds of his people's hearts. In it he has conquered the stronghold of his people's hearts. You see, before God saved you, your heart was like the stronghold of Zion, which said, no way will I allow you to conquer me. No way will I let you tell me what to do. No way will I succumb to your law. No way am I going to surrender to Christ. I'm going to lead my life the way I want to lead it. You will never tell me how to live my life. I will live it the way I want to live it. Like Frankie said, I'm going to do it my way. And then even in our weakest moments, we say, I can still resist you. Throw your best sermons at me. Throw your sinners in the hands of an angry God at me. I'm not breaking. I'm not coming. You will not win me. But God, but God shed the light of the gospel and the glory of His Son in your heart, if you know Him today. right? And Christ crushed your stronghold, and He obliterated them at the cross. He eradicated sin, sin which deserves an eternal death. He defeated them at Calvary, slaying our, your, my rebellious hearts and replacing them with a new one, a new heart that beats for him. And he turned off our strongholds of Zion, guess what, into his dwelling place. So now the very presence of God lives in his people. Before the God of this world ruled your heart, but Jesus has expelled him. Jesus has ousted the strong man. And now he takes up residence himself. As Galatians 2.20 said, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ and it is not, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Again, he said in Colossians 1.27, to whom God willed to make known what the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is that mystery? Which is Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. Ephesians 3.17 says that Christ dwells in our hearts. How? Through faith. There are a host of other verses telling us that the Father and the Son and the Spirit live in us. They've taken up residence in us. So God loves Zion because figuratively speaking, that is where He conquered your heart. And that is where He conquered my heart. And that is where He now dwells. And the question for all here today is this. Has He conquered your heart? Has he conquered your heart? Or are you like the Jebusites, arrogantly fighting against him? It's a serious question. It's a life and death question. It's an eternal question. Has he conquered your heart? Is he dwelling in you? Or are you like the Jebusites saying, no way. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up this world. I love this world. 
I love my city. Well, another reason the Lord loves Zion is because it represents the corporate worship of His people. It represents the church. And I believe that the Lord loves Zion more than the dwellings of Jacob because He loves the public gathering of His people. He loves the public worship of His people. Even more so, if you will, than private worship of His people, which I believe the dwellings of Jacob represent the private worship. But make no mistake, He loves private worship. He certainly loves that. But He loves all the more when His called ones, His elect, His saints, gather together to praise and worship Him. When they gather to offer up, as Hebrews 13, 15 says, the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. So when they come together, they come together to hear, to hear and, and to expound His word, and to bless His name, and to exalt His Son, and to remember His cross, to pray for His presence and His power, to do His will, to make Him known and to know Him, and to cry out, Our Father, who art in heaven, Listen, the Lord delights when His people worship Him as a community. That is why most of the epistles are written to churches. And that is why the pastoral epistles, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus and Philemon, are written to how to govern the church. And this is why we are commanded in Hebrews 10.25 that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We're not to forsake this. As is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. This is why the church is called the house of God. Because the people who dwell in it, he, he, he lives in. And I'm not talking about just the building, I'm talking about the people. And he is, Christ is the head of the church. And it is his body, we're told, in Colossians 1.18. And Jesus said in Matthew 16.18 that the church is built on the truth that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that not even the gates of death can prevail against it. And that no sin, nor death, nor the devil, or demons can stop or slow down the growth and the mission of His church. That the dynamite power of the gospel goes out, and guess what? God is saving sinners. Amen. And it started out real small, did it not? With just 12 apostles and some disciples, like a mustard seed or a little leaven in some bread. But it has grown, and it has spread out through most of the world, and God has been saving people from many different nations. Thus, God loves genuine corporate worship. Listen, we don't come here to see each other, although it's awful nice to see each other. But we come here to meet with the Lord. Right? We come here to hear from His Word. We come to express our love for Him, to the one who has lavished His love upon us through Christ. And if we don't come here for that reason, or if we're sporadic in coming to corporate worship, or if we're really consistently late in coming to corporate worship, then I think we need to check our own hearts. If this is like no big deal, oh, it's Sunday, I'll go to church. Well, maybe not. Grandma's coming, i got to cook. This should be important to us. Amen. This should be the highlight of our week. The highlight of the Christian's week should be when he comes to praise God with the people of God. Amen. That we're coming through the gates of Zion, so to speak, to meet with him. Privately, yes. Corporately, Absolutely. So we look forward to coming here. We prepare to come here. We pray for God's moving among us when we come here. That's why we should sing with gusto to the Lord, is it not? Amen. They're not just songs that you know a couple of guys practice and a couple of people play and we just throw them on this because we know how to do it. Well, someone knows how to do it. <laughs> because we're singing to Him. We should, we should be... When we're singing those words, there should be prayers in our own hearts. I mean, we're singing gospel-saturated songs, hymns and contemporary songs that exalt Him. Amen. That's why we should hang on every word that is taught in Sunday school. And we should hang on every word that is preached from the pulpit, not because I'm preaching it, or because Pastor Steve would preach it, or because Phil would preach it, but because it's the Word of God, and I want to hear the Word of God. And we should delight when we hear the gospel over and over and over again because it's the very gospel that saved us. Amen. We should never get tired of that. 
Do you get tired of hearing the gospel? I'm telling you, I don't get tired. I love hearing the gospel. And the beauty of it is, it, it can come a thousand different ways. I mean, guys preach it in so many different ways and it never gets old and it's always fresh because it's true. Even as the verse that Phil read today, there's only one gospel, and that is that God did everything and you did nothing. That you were dead in your sins and you deserve to go to hell for your sins. And Christ, out of love and mercy, and God, because of his electing love and mercy, predestined you to eternal life. Hallelujah. And he has brought his son to save you. And Christ lived and died for you. And all you brought to the party was your sin. Amen. And I love hearing that story. The old, old story. And we should pray that as we hear the God, God's word taught that he would apply it to our hearts. And it would not be just thinking about the other guy who needs it, but I need it. Stir my heart. Make me more holy. Give me a bigger view of God. Cause me to see my sin. Change my wicked heart. And believe you me, it's wicked and it's got a lot of black spots on it. This is also why we should be cheerful givers when the offering is taken. Because we're meeting with God. We're giving back to him. Well, the psalmist says how much he, the Lord, loves the gates of Zion and adds, glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. And the glorious things spoken of Zion or the city of God or the church is first and foremost about the founder of the church, Jesus Christ, for he is the glorious one. He is the one who the church rests on. It is resting on his perfect sin atoning work and his glorious resurrection. And it declares his glorious gospel which tells us how he gloriously saves sinners and he raises up the saints. And in it is the glorious hope the saints have of the resurrection of the dead and eternal life with Christ. And in it we see that, that he has made a glorious people, a holy nation, a special people, and a royal priesthood to God. And, and these people are like the holy mountains in that they cannot be moved. You can't move a mountain. And that's what we're like in Christ. We're like those holy mountains. We cannot be moved. The salvation of Christ's people is secure. It's in Christ and it can never be shaken or lost. Yes, Lord. Amen. And listen, it is a glorious thing. It is a glorious thing to be part of Christ's universal or invisible church. It is a glorious thing to be a Christian. And it is a glorious thing that we are the Lamb's bride. That we are beloved by Him. And we're beloved by Him and the Father from the foundation or before the foundation of the world. And He cares for us. And He has angels watching over us. And He is preparing for us a wedding feast when He returns. And we're the bride. We're the bride and He's the groom. He's coming to take us to Himself. And He has given us His righteousness as a royal robe to wear. That's what makes us righteous is Him. And he's given us his spirit. And his spirit is a guarantee. A guarantee that he's going to keep us in this life and bring us into the glorious one to come. Amen. So God loves the church. And glorious things are spoken of the church. And by his electing love, every believer everywhere is a part of his universal church. And so the Lord's love for the city of God. Secondly, the people of the city of God, verses 4 to 6. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me. Oh, behold, Philistia and Tyre and Ethiopia. This one was born in her. And of Zion it will be said, this one that was born in her. And the Most High himself shall establish her. The Lord will record when he registers the peoples. This one was born there. Salem. Well, in verse 3, the psalmist said, glorious things are spoken of the city of God. And one of those glorious things is that the Gentile nations would one day become part of the city of God. That the Gentiles, who the Jews hated, and if they didn't hate them, they certainly viewed them as unclean or lesser human beings, that the Gentiles were coming in. The Gentiles would be part of Zion. And that was an incomprehensible thought to the Jews. The Jews in Jesus' day, they were furious with Jesus when in Luke 4 he said he was the Messiah. He fulfilled the prophecy of the Messiah. And then he reminded them he reminded them that Elijah was sent to a Gentile widow and not to any Jewish widows. And that Elisha healed a Gentile leper and no Jewish lepers. Implying that God was being gracious to the Gentiles and that some of them would believe. Some of them would believe in Jesus whom the Jews rejected. 
In the parable of the Great Supper in Luke 14, Jesus again alludes to the fact that the Gentiles are coming into the kingdom. Right there we see a man gives a great supper for his son and he tells his servants to, to tell those invited to the supper to come. But, but they offered all kinds of excuses why they couldn't come and they didn't come. So the man tells his servant, he says, listen, go quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in, bring here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. Well, the servant does that and still there's more room. And so the man says in verse 23, then go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. So the kingdom was preached to the Jews and they by and large rejected it. But the Gentiles would hear it and they would believe and they would enter it. Well, we know that the early church, which was, of course, mainly Jewish because the first believers were Jews who believed, they had a hard time accepting the fact that the Gentiles were included in God's kingdom. That's why the Lord gave Peter a vision and he gave it to him three times of a sheep coming down out of heaven with all kinds of unclean animals on it. Peter's in a trance, he's hungry, he's on top of Simon, um, uh, Simon the Tanner's house uh, and he's very hungry and he's in a trance and basically he sees this vision of this, this sheep coming down out of heaven with all kinds of unclean animals on it and the Lord tells him, he tells him, Peter, kill and eat. Peter's hungry. And this thing goes on three times. But Peter says, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything uncommon common or unclean. I won't eat that. And the Lord replies after three times, he says, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was to show Peter and the Jews that God was saving the Gentiles as well. And he was adding them to his kingdom. And that God had cleansed the Gentiles as well. Well, if the Jews in Peter's day were scouring their Old Testament scriptures, they would have claimed that it was always God's intention to save the Gentiles. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, the Lord said to Abraham, In your seed all, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. All of them. He said the same thing to Isaac in Genesis 26. In Isaiah 2, he said that all the nations would flow, all the nations would flow into the Lord's house. In Psalm 22, 27, we read, All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, all of them. And in Psalm 86, verse 9, we read, All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. And there are many other Old Testament verses which, which say the Gentiles were included and that Christ was going to save them too. The point is this, it has always been God's plan always been his plan to save the Gentiles and, and Psalm 87 just spells this out really clearly for us. Now in verse 4 uh, we read in Psalm 87 that it is now it is now God is going to be speaking and he says this he says I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me behold all Philistia uh, and Tyra with Ethiopia this one was born here. And what he does is he names five Gentile nations to represent all the Gentile nations. And these five, the Jews would have been very familiar with. He says, Rahab. Uh, and the word literally means fierceness. And Rahab means insolent, pride. And Rahab is another name for Egypt. Uh, and the Jews, of course, were once slaves in Egypt who treated them very harshly. Then he says, Babylon, uh, who eventually, of course, would destroy Jerusalem, slaughter her people, burn down her city of Jerusalem, and then take away the rest captive. Then he says, Philistia. And that basically is speaking of the Philistines. They were long-time bitter enemies of Israel. And then he says Tyra. Uh, and Tyra was known for its beauty and its wealth, but also for its arrogance and its godlessness. And lastly, he says Ethiopia, also known as Cush. Uh, and they were a very far and distant people. Uh, and so all of those, in and of themselves, they boasted in themselves, and they boasted in their power, and they boasted in their riches. And most of them hated Israel, which one day... Uh, would, 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 would be a people with Israel, and these people would one day be born in Zion. Well, they would not physically be born in Zion, but they would spiritually be born in Zion. Right? They would one day be born in the city of God, meaning that one day they would be born again. One day they would be born again. That enemies of Christ would one day become his friends and his followers. So the unthinkable would happen. The Gentiles would be one people with the Jews. Peter would say in Acts 15, 
at the Jerusalem Council, verses 7 to 9. He says, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us uh, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. The Gentiles. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between them and us, purifying their hearts by faith. Jesus would say in John 10, he says, it says, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. In other words, it's not just you. It's not just you guys here and now. It's not just Israel. It's not just Jews. I have other sheep. I have other sheep. And I must bring them, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. And as Paul would say to the Jewish leaders in Acts 28, 28, that salvation, the salvation of God, has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And they will hear it. So foreign nations would be enrolled in Zion by their new birth. All kinds of enemies, the riffraff, if you will, would be born in her. And it really doesn't make one iota of a difference what skin color you have or what culture you are from or your social standing in this life. They are all useless and they are divisive and they are hurtful and sinful arguments. For as Galatians 3, 27 and 28 says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Now three times in verses 4 to 6 we read, this one was born there, or this one and that one was born in her, or this one was born in her. And what this is saying is they've been born from above, or born again, or they've been regenerated. So yes, they were physically born in Rahab, or Babylon, or Philistia, or Tyre, or Ethiopia, but they were born again into the kingdom of God. Not all of them, not every single person, but this one and that one. A remnant. And although the scripture doesn't say this, I think that Jesus may have well used this passage when speaking to Nicodemus about the new birth in John chapter 3. That God so loved the world, meaning both Jew and Gentile. He loves Gentiles too. Well, to be born again or born in Zion or to be regenerated means to be made spiritually alive, have spiritual life. And it's the one time miraculous work of God where he takes takes a soul that is dead and trespasses and sins and makes them instantaneously alive or spiritually alive in Christ. He reverts them. And where he gives them a new heart. And he puts in them a new spirit. And he takes out the heart of stone out of their flesh. And he gives them, as he says in Ezekiel 36, a heart of flesh. Or as Paul says in Titus, he says he has saved them through the washing of regeneration. And the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Listen, to be born again means, means to be spiritually alive. Amen. That's what it means. You're alive. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, you were dead spiritually. Not physically. Spiritually. And you must be birthed again. Or as Peter says, to be born from above. Well, this new heart that he now gives us, it beats for God because the law of God is written on it. And now one is alive to God and they want God. And he gives them the gifts of faith and repentance. And because they're born in Zion or born again, they are entitled to certain privileges. They are entitled to certain privileges because of where they're born. Right? Just as, as there are certain privileges of one who was born in this country, like citizenship, like the right to vote, like supposedly a speedy and a fair trial, well, so too for the one who was born in Zion. They are immediately, immediately adopted into the family of God. The moment that you are born again, the moment you are regenerated, you become a child of God. You become family. Listen, if you're not a believer today, you cannot call God your father. Amen. But if he saves you, if he rebirths you, if he regenerates you, then Jesus said, when you pray, pray, our father. Amen. You're immediately children of God. 1 John 3, 1. And this is an amazing thing. It says, behold, look at this. It's amazing. Who can understand it? Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. What is that love? That we should be called the children of God. Why does He need us? Well, He doesn't. Why does He want us? Because He loves us. And He wants to love us. And He's chosen to love us. Well, not only are they children of God, they have the Spirit of the living God dwelling in them. 
And they are in Christ, and Christ is in them. And they have a right to call God their Father. And they have a right to pray to Him always, and expecting Him to hear it. And they have a right to an, an eternal inheritance. Listen, when you're in the family, guess what parents leave their children? Well, they leave them something, don't they? They leave them an inheritance. Well, God has given us an inheritance. You know what our inheritance is? It is, it is Christ in glory. Eternal life with Christ in glory. We're going to have a glorified, resurrected body and soul. Just like he has now. And we have the right right now to enjoy rich, heavenly blessings, his blessings. And, and, and to hold on to and claim the promises of God. The promises he gives us are our promises. And this includes every single person that he saves. Every single one of his elect. Not just the more spiritual. Not just the more mature. All of us. Whether you've been born again for 30 seconds, or you've been born again for, for 130 years, since you live so long. Because Galatians 4.26 says that, that Jerusalem, the Jerusalem above, is the mother of us all. The Jerusalem above, it's spiritual. It's not physical, literal. So then all of them are now citizens of heaven. Paul said in Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship is in heaven. And if our citizenship is in heaven then our ultimate allegiance should be there, should it not? You see, the place of one's birth in this world really doesn't matter anymore. You could have been born in Brooklyn. You could have been born in the DR. You could have been born in the back seat of a Greyhound bus going down Highway 41, and quite honestly, it doesn't mean anything. It is useless in the end. What really matters is that you've been born in Zion, or in the city of God, and you are now a citizen of His kingdom. And the amazing news here is that God is birthing people into his kingdom from all over the world. From every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And one of the beautiful things about Grace Baptist Church and other churches like Grace Baptist Church is we get a little flavor of it here, a little sprinkling of the fact that we're from many different places. Different countries. We have different skin tones and, and shades. And the truth is, that doesn't mean anything. Because we're in Christ. We share the same blood. We're owned by the same master and king. Yes. We're in the same family. We're going to worship him forever. Amen. So from every tribe and tongue and, and people and nation. And although this is a great multitude, and he says so, God knows every single one of us. Because verse 6 says, the Lord will record when he registers the peoples, this one was born there. And this is kind of like a census. It's kind of like him taking a census where the Lord writes down the names of those who were born in Zion. You see, he has recorded every one of them. He knows exactly who was born in Zion. And he's not going to miss one. Like, one is not going to, like, sort of, you know, be lost. It's not like going to the, uh, you know, New York City to get your birth certificate records where you may not find them. He has them. Or as Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. Now, this language of the Lord recording or writing the names of people, his people, in a book, uh, it's in the Bible. It's a figure of speech, of course, but it can be found six times in the New Testament, five in Revelation and one in Philippians 4. And in fact, Luke 10 alludes to it as well. When Jesus' disciples, they return from sharing the gospel, doing all kinds of miracles in his, in his name, casting out demons and whatnot. And they say to him in verse 17, they say, Lord, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. We're amazed. What power. What an amazing gift that we can do this kind of stuff. But what does Jesus say to them? Does he go, Yahoo, good for you, great? No. Here's what he says in verse 20. Do not rejoice in this. Do not rejoice that you can do these things in my name. He says, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So don't rejoice because of your gifts or your abilities. Don't rejoice because you have a lot of knowledge or that you have victory over things in life. Rejoice rather that God has chosen you, Amen. that God has elected you, that he's written your name down. Rejoice that God has sovereignly willed to choose you to be his son or his daughter. Rejoice in that. Before the foundation of the world, he chose you. Rejoice that he, he, he chose you based solely on his sovereign will and, on his love, and out of his love. You know, the fact that your name is written in heaven, you know what that ought to do? 
The fact that God chose you before the world began, you know what that ought to do? It ought to squelch all pride. There's no pounding the chest. There's no thinking you're better than somebody. Listen, the only reason why you are saved, and maybe the guy next to you isn't, is because God chose to save you. And you're no better than the guy next to you. And because your name is written there, and your birth certificate is recorded in Zion, you have a steadfast hope. And you have a rock-solid assurance of who you are in Christ. So then, so then, when Satan whispers in your ear, or when someone else is telling you that you're no good, you're a wretch, look at you, sinner. Well, you say, it's true. I am a wretch. It is true. I am no good. Sadly, it is true. I am a, a disgusting sinner at times. But then pull out your birth certificate Amen. and show them where it says Zion on the city of birth. That's right. Amen. And when you're doubting your salvation or your heart is extremely troubled because of your sin, glance again at the cross. Remember where you were born and who brought you to life. So the Lord's love for the city of God. Secondly, the people of the city of God. And lastly, the joy. The joy in the city of God. Verse 7. Both the singers and the players on the say, All my springs are in you. Well, we see from verse 1, both the singers and the players on instruments are the sons of Korah, and they are worshiping the one who has recorded their names in Zion. Uh, and their song of praise is this, All my springs are in you. And springs is another word for wells or for a fountain. Basically, it means a flowing water. Uh, and what springs or fountains or wells are is their water that refreshes. They're refreshing water. And, and what they're saying is this, all of our refreshment is in Zion. All of our refreshment is in Zion because that is where God is. Right? And, and that is where he meets with his people. But listen, brothers and sisters, our refreshment is not in a place, it's not in a city. It is in Christ. Our refreshment is in Christ. In John 4, Jesus met a Samaritan woman by a well. And he asked her for a physical drink of water. And she said, well, listen, Jewish men don't speak to Samaritan women. And listen to what he said to her in verse 10. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked of him. And what would he have done? He would have given you living water. Then in verse 14, he said this, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So Jesus will satisfy the one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. He will satisfy them with his spirit. And he will satisfy them with himself. And he will be more than enough to fill their, their hearts and their souls. He'll be more than enough. He will give them the springs of faith and the springs of assurance. And he will fresh, refresh them in his word. He said in John 7.37, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Let him come. So he fulfills our thirst to know God and to know fellowship with God. And he has promised in Revelation 21.6 to give the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. Anybody who thirsts, he gives it. Therefore, as Isaiah 12.3 says, with joy we will draw water from the wells of salvation. With joy we will draw it. So then, so then while we live in this wilderness, while we live in this desert, with a people who are parched and dehydrated and, and dying, we are constantly refreshed in Christ, are we not? Amen. All of our springs, all of our spiritual power, all of the graces that God bestows on us, they're in Christ. Well, let me close by saying how blessed every believer in this room is that God would rebirth you. Make you a citizen of His holy city and a member of His church. This alone should always keep our springs flowing, should they not? Amen. That God would love you so much that He would open the gates of Zion. And by the way, this sermon in opening up those gates of Zion, because to open up those gates, that cost Jesus His life. To open them up for us, that cost Him His life, so that you and I could enter it. But He opened them up so we could enter. And since God loves Zion... Since he loves corporate worship, since he loves the church, should not we, his people, love to gather together to make much of him in the preaching and in the singing and the praising and the praying to him of the local congregation? Should not we, his people, love the church? 
And we need to ask ourselves, do I really love the church the way I should? Do you love his people? Do you love his gathering of his called out ones? Do you delight to come together with the saints? To lift them up, to hear from him, and to fellowship with his people. Do you serve him in the church? Do you faithfully give to his church? Are you an active part of the life of his church? May it be that our love would grow for what God loves more than even the dwellings of Jacob. Amen? Amen. Now, a question to every unbeliever, to those who are not yet born in Zion. If the church is Zion and the church is a city of God, is it wise to keep neglecting becoming a citizen of it? Is it wise of you to keep neglecting becoming a citizen of it? Because the reality is, you don't want to leave this world outside of the gates of Zion. You don't want, it's all figurative language, basically, you don't want to be outside of Christ. Amen. You don't want to be outside of His gates. You don't want to be outside of the gates that keeps you outside of heaven. And if you're outside of the gates of Zion, you're outside of heaven, and guess what? That destines you for eternal hell. You don't want to be there. And what's keeping you on the outside is your love of sin and your unwillingness to surrender to Christ. You like Christ, maybe. You might believe in some of the stuff that the Bible says about Him, but you don't want Him controlling your life. You don't want Him telling you how to live. You don't want Him butting into your business. But know this, if He's not your Lord, and He's not your Master, He's certainly not your Savior, but what He will be is your judge. And you will forever regret that. And you'll have all eternity to regret that. But here's the good news. The good news today is that the gates of Zion are still open. They're still open today. And you can still come to Christ. And you can be saved. Amen. You can be saved from your sin. You can be saved from the wages of your sin. You can be saved from the wrath of God because of your sin against the Holy God. And you can be saved from them because, because Christ will have taken it for you. But you must recognize that you are a sinner before a very holy God. And you must cry out for, for cleansing and forgiveness. You must cry out that the blood that washes away a sinner's stains and makes him pure would be the same blood that would wash away your sin. That would be applied to you. But you are cleansing. Because that and that alone was the only thing that will make you acceptable before God. So then come to Christ. Trust in Christ. Surrender to Christ. And then you too can be assured that your name is recorded in Zion. And thus written in heaven. Amen. 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 Let us pray now as the ushers come forward. Lord, what an amazing truth that Christ would come to save sinners, that he would open the gates, so to speak, that we could have fellowship with you and come to you and know you and be in you. And Father, I pray for your people. Oh Lord, may this truth be precious, that you would save us, that you would record our names in heaven, that we would have our birth certificate written in Zion, and all of these metaphors and figures of speech, meaning that you saved us and Lord, made us made us born from above. Lord, I pray that we would love you for it. I pray that we would serve you with all of our heart. Lord, I pray that we would be active members in your church. Lord, I pray that we would not take corporate worship lightly. I pray that it would be a serious thing to us. That, Lord, it would be the most important day of our week that we would delight to come and to sing praises to you and to hear the word of God and to fellowship with the saints. Lord, please put that on our hearts. I pray that there is such a, a lack in this area. And Lord, for the souls sitting here this day that are not saved, that have never been born from above, that do not have a birth certificate in Zion, Lord, please, Lord, for your glory's sake and because of your great mercy, would you save your souls. And Lord, now thank you for the, the monies that you give us. Lord, you don't need our money, but you want us to trust you and to give uh, cheerfully and joyfully and generously. And Lord, I pray that we would do just that for the furtherance of your gospel to make your name known in this place and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen.